Now, with benefit of hindsight, is there something that you regret today about your presidency? Was that something that you did then that you probably would have done differently? Me? What I did everything that I should do the way I should do that. But what about Odi? The invasion of uh, a village in Odi where some where the whole village was wiped out. Of course, if you have if I have soldiers and police who are the instrument by which I should maintain security and I send police and they were killed, and I sent soldiers, and they were killed, what do you expect me to do? If you were in my position, what will you do? You will fold your arms? You answer me, my dear brother. Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> no okay. Odi Town is a community in the Odi local government area by Elsa State that is predominantly dominated by the Ijo people. Trouble broke out in the community when on November 4, 1999, several members of the Nigerian police were murdered by a gang near Odi. More attacks and murders continued in the days that followed, bringing the total number of murdered policemen to 12. This was a development that was both troubling and unacceptable to the presidency and so the military was brought in to intervene. The Odi operation was not just an army operation. It involved the army, the navy and the police. Each institution had a role to play. The inspector general of police was present at the meetings but he directed the deputy inspector general to join us in Port Harcourt. I flew from Abuja to Port Harcourt with the chief of naval staff, Vice Admiral Ombu. We went through Wari in a military aircraft, which eventually took us to Port Harcourt. We met at the Hotel Presidential Port Harcourt with the General Officer Commanding the 82nd Division, the Brigade Commander in Port Harcourt, the Naval Commander in Port Harcourt, and the Police Commissioner. Each unit, the Army, Navy, and Police, had its specific role in the operation. The Navy was to use flat bottom boats on the creeks to ensure that none of the troublemakers escaped through the creeks. The army was to cordon off the city to enable the police go in and search the area for the hoodlums who had killed police officers and soldiers. The operation was well planned and the date was fixed at the end of our meeting. I flew back to Abuja and monitored the operation from there. On D-Day, we commenced the operation as planned. The plan was brilliant and well designed to avoid collateral damage to civilians and property. The road from Kayama to Wari was blocked so that no vehicle interfered with movements of troops or tipped off the people. No vehicle was allowed to overtake the convoy. We moved without an incident for approximately 50 miles. Less than 40 miles to Odi, we ran into an ambush. I suspect that either somebody in the Navy, Army or the police had tipped off the people. We lost a vital component of any military operation, the element of surprise. The bandits and hoodlums had known well in advance that we were coming and they were prepared for us. The ambush was so ferocious and well orchestrated that we lost three soldiers on the spot. At that point, the commanding officer, surprised by the ferocity of the attacks on the troops, called to ask me whether I should call off the operation. I responded by asking him if he had achieved his objectives. He responded in the non-affirmative. So I responded by telling him that he did not need me to answer that question. The convoy continued until they got to the outskirts of Odi town where they again came under even more heavy and sustained fire. People were shooting at them from built up areas. By training, soldiers faced with deadly threats do not throw up their arms in the air and hope that the enemies will be merciful and spare their lives. They return fire to take out the threats. We are not police officers. We do not fire in the knees. If you fire from a building, I will dislodge you from your comfort zone by taking out the building. This is exactly what happened at Odi. The soldiers had no option but to return fire and save themselves from what otherwise would have been a cold-blooded massacre of soldiers carrying out legitimate orders. No soldier would shoot at a civilian who posed no threat to him. As soon as the shooting subsided, the soldiers moved in but by that time, the bandits had escaped towards the creeks. 
Meanwhile, the Navy had not moved as planned and had not condoned off the creeks, making it possible for the people firing at us to escape through the creeks. The police on their part were nowhere to be seen. So the army was exposed and wrongly perceived as the main culprit in the failure of the mission. The army's mission had been to assist the police to maintain law and order. The army was not supposed to be involved in the searching and arresting. That was not our responsibility. So I didn't even say anything other than the officer in charge. I said, look, what happened? Come and report to me. He said he was going to, uh, I think, four or five of his soldiers were ambushed and killed. I said, in a normal conventional war, if I lose five soldiers, the enemy will know that uh, uh, something has happened. So what happened? Then he looked at me. And then I asked the second time, I said, what happened? Then he saluted, he said, I know, sir. So he went away. That's all. I immediately briefed the president and told him that our mission had failed and explained the situation. He said that we had done our best. I had hoped that he would ask the Navy to explain why they had backed out. It is curious that even to this day, nobody has bothered to find out why the Navy did not carry out the assignment as planned. I have also believed and still believe that soldiers should not be involved in basic law enforcement duties. The army has neither the training nor the disposition for such assignments. Questions about the performance of the military at OD should rightly be directed to those who ordered the army into OD in the first place. The army did not gratuitously inject itself into OD. We were asked to come in by the civilian authorities. It is not the job of a soldier to question the morality or rationale behind orders. In fact, it would have been a gross insubordination and a very serious violation of military code of justice if the army had failed to carry out the directives of the commander-in-chief. As a soldier, I was trained to obey the last command of my superiors, even if I had reservations about the correctness of such an order. Once the order was given, my job was to work out the technical details. The soldiers performed credibly under very dangerous and difficult circumstances. It is very unfair for people in the confines of their homes and behind newspaper desks to second-guess the actions of soldiers who were ambushed by armed thugs. Expecting detachment and restraint in the face of fire has never been part of military training. Self-defense is the first law of nature and an integral part of the military rules of engagement. There may be debates about whether self-defense had mutated into overkill, but that does not negate the underlying fundamental premise. Soldiers faced with organized and sustained fire have the right to defend themselves. Politicians with self-serving agendas conveniently ignore the true facts and pursue their hidden agenda with vigor. Journalists in their bid to sensationalize the issue either distorted the facts or downright told lies in their attempt to discredit the military. Any right-thinking and fair-minded person should have questioned the culpability of the civilians who opened fire on a military convoy. What did they expect? Did they believe that the army would just roll over and play dead? Would it have pleased the parties if the army had simply stood idly while their colleagues were murdered, cold blood by thugs? But do you regret the killing of women and children in that invasion? I feel bad by any, of any soldier, being, of any individual being killed. I feel bad. But don't forget I have other responsibilities. <laughs>